Amen. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Benji, for the prayer and for leading us this morning and some wonderful singing. And what a great song to sing there to remind ourselves that our God is a, <clears throat> he is a holy God, is he not? And uh, he calls us to be holy people as well. Well, take your Bibles again this morning and uh, open them up to the book of James. If you're visiting with us or if you've been away for a few weeks, uh, we've been looking at this wonderful book and James has been teaching us in the first section of this letter how to handle trials and how to handle them from a biblical perspective. I mean, all of us face trials, don't we, of various shapes and sizes and colors. Some trials that we face, uh, you could say maybe reasonably easy to handle, but then there are other trials that we're faced with that are intense, they're painful, they're long-lasting, and they can be very, very difficult to handle. And yet the exhortation that James has given us, he said that it doesn't really matter how big the trial is or how small the trial is, we are to count them all joy. Count them joy because they are strengthening our faith and they're training us to persevere. These trials are helping us to be more mature and ultimately we looked at how they make us more and more like Jesus Christ. And last Sunday, we looked at the fact that if we're struggling to cope in the middle of a trial, if it's becoming too intense for us, and if we're facing suffering or persecution or whatever it might be, and if it's difficult, then we should ask God to help us, and especially ask Him for wisdom in the middle of the trial. And James has also taught us that it really doesn't matter what our social status is. If you're a wealthy Christian or whether you are a poor Christian, you're going to face trials. And if you respond the right way to them, whether you're rich or poor, it is going to teach you humility. And they're going to remind us that money is not our greatest priority. Trials are going to teach us that Christ is our greatest treasure and our greatest prize that we've already sung about this morning. And so we should keep our eyes focused on Him, even as we've sung about this morning as well. Because when we all get to heaven, there's not going to be the wealthy Christians over here and the poor Christians over here. We're all going to be the same. We're all going to bask in the glories of heaven together. And so trials teach both the rich and the poor to trust God. And if we respond biblically to a trial by remaining steadfast and trusting God, we learned last week as well that we will be blessed by God. And it brings with it a great reward. That is, we will receive, James says, the crown of life, which means at least that we will experience eternal life in heaven, but there may even be something more than that that James is talking about, but he doesn't explain exactly what it is. But we will be blessed. And so in a nutshell, as we think about trials, we should not see them as something that is negative in our life, but something that is positive because God uses them to mature us in Christ. And as we return back to chapter 1 this morning, we're faced with a new scenario. And that is when God brings a trial into our life, whether he brings it directly or maybe indirectly through Satan or through demons or through other people, and if we end up responding badly to that trial, in other words, if we start sinning in the midst of that trial by having ungodly thoughts or maybe by saying things that are unkind or wrong or maybe acting sinfully, the question is, can we blame God because He was the instigator of that trial in our life? If you remember, the, the first readers of this letter were facing severe persecution. And they may have been tempted to retaliate against their persecutors. Or perhaps they might have even been looking for some avenues of sinful pleasure to negate their difficult circumstances. And if so, if they were tempted and if they were sinned, was it legitimate for them to put the blame on God for their sin because God was the one who brought about the trial in the first place? 
That's what James is going to address with us this morning in the verses that we're going to look at. And we're going to look at verses 13 to 18. We probably won't get through all of them this morning, but we'll begin in verse 13. And I want to read the, the passage to us. You can follow along in your Bible, or maybe the, the words will be up on the screen as well. Beginning in verse 13. <clears throat> Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now, before we jump into the text, I want you to cast your mind back if you were here a couple of weeks ago. And if you remember, I said to you that the the original Greek word that we translate trial in English, which we've read about in verse 2 and verse 12, it is the same word in the original Greek language that is also translated in these verses, the word tempted. It is the word peresmos. Sometimes it's in the form of a noun, sometimes it's in the form of a verb, but it's the same word in the original. And remember, I said to you a couple of weeks ago that it is the context of the passage that determines which English word we use. So when we were looking at verses 2 through to verse 12, we were talking about an external trial or an external test, things like persecution or suffering or poverty or hardship, things that are outside of us. And so the word is translated in English, the word trials, they're external to us. But here in verses 13 and 14, the context changes. It's still referring to a testing, but this time it is a test which the person has failed because they have sinned internally. And that's why it is translated translated temptation or the word tempted. And so it's also helpful to understand, as we go through this passage this morning, that when we read the word tempted, we need to understand, when when, when we see it here in this context, it means, I was tempted, and I subsequently gave in to the temptation, and I sinned. That's what the word tempted means in these verses. You know, English is a frustrating language, isn't it? I know many of you feel that, but it's a frustrating language in many ways because the word temptation can be used in two different ways. One of them involves sinning, and one of them doesn't. For example, if I was to say this sentence, I was tempted to sin, but I withstood the temptation, then I haven't actually sinned when I say that. But I could say another sentence that says, I was tempted to sin, saying the same thing, and I gave in to my temptation, and I sinned terribly. And so sometimes the context helps you understand what that word temptation means. Sometimes we mean it, and we're not sinning, and sometimes we use it, and it means we are sinning. And so when we see the word temptation here in verse 13 and 14, it would be okay for us to think in our mind that this temptation is a failed test. And that failed test um, resulted in a sinful response, whether it be a thought, whether it be a word, or whether it be a sinful action. That's the context of these verses. So if you think of verses 13 and 14, if you're looking at them in your Bible there, I could sort of paraphrase those verses this way. Let no one say when he is tempted and subsequently sins, I am being tempted to sin by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one in order to cause them to sin. But each person is tempted and falls into sin 
when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And so I think it's also helpful for us to remember as we're thinking about this subject that a trial and a temptation, both of them are tests. And let's not forget this, that God tests us, we saw that a couple of weeks ago, God tests us by sending trials into our lives, and He does it with the intention that we would pass the test and become more mature. That's what we've looked at in verses 2 to 12 already. His purpose, God's purpose behind trials is never to destroy our faith or to entice us to sin. That's never God's intention. However, If we are in the midst of a trial and we start sinning in that trial, then we have failed the test and it has at that point become for us a sinful temptation. So we're going to do a little bit of a look at at temptation today and probably next Sunday as well. We want to do a bit of an investigation into these verses. And first of all, I want to show you in this passage what I've called the source of temptation in verses 13 and 14. This would be our first main point in the message this morning, the source of temptation. And we see in these verses that it's not God. The source of temptation is not God. Look at that verse 13 again. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. So here in the context of James chapter 1, we can say God will test us, yes, we understand that, but he will never tempt us, causing us to sin. And James makes it perfectly clear that it is a huge mistake if we are to play the blame game with God. When you're facing trials, when you're facing persecutions and challenges in this life, and you find yourself getting into a sinful mess, and you find yourself reacting badly to the trial, you cannot point the finger at God and say, God, it's your fault. If you remember Adam, that's what he did, right, in the Garden of Eden, right back at the very beginning. Remember, Adam and Eve had just been caught sinning, and God confronts them, and what did Adam say? First of all, he tries to blame his wife, and then he indirectly tries to blame God. In Genesis 3, verse 12, Adam says this, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. And so Adam tries to blame her, his wife, and he tries to blame God as well. He was trying to duck for cover, wasn't he, by blaming somebody else. You know, it's one of the oldest tricks in the book, isn't it, to blame somebody else for our sin. But it's also one of the most irresponsible and disgraceful reactions to our own sin. In fact, Eve tried to play the same game as well. In the very next verse, the Lord said to the woman, to Eve, what is this that you have done? And what did the woman do? She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And so she played the same game by blaming the serpents. And mankind has been blaming others ever since then. And we, don't, we know, don't we, those of us who are parents, that kids are experts at blaming others. And parents are also pretty good at it as well. And so James says to us, hey, you can't do that. You can't blame God. In fact, he says there that you can't even speak those words because verse 13, it's actually an imperative. It's in the command form. Let no one say, I am being tempted by God. Let no one say, God caused me to sin. We should never say that. God is not directly nor is he indirectly responsible for your sin. And we will see that we need to take personal responsibility for our sin. Because as verse 13 says, God cannot tempt us to sin because He Himself cannot be tempted with evil. I mean, this is a a powerful statement here of God's character. He cannot be tempted with evil. We just sung it before, as I said. God is holy. That means that God has no inclination towards evil. 
He's not drawn towards evil. He's not attracted by evil. In fact, God hates evil. He, he, evil cannot undermine his character. It can't overpower him. It can't affect him. It has no hold over him whatsoever. We know that God has no capacity to sin. It's impossible for God to sin. It has never happened and it never will happen because there is no evil in God. He's pure, he's perfect, and he's sinless. In fact, you can read over in the Old Testament in, in, in a Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. You might see it on the screen. God, speaking of God, it says there that you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Psalm 5 verse 4 says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. God does not have a personal relationship with sin whatsoever. Sure, He knows all about it. And He can use it in the lives of others to enhance His own glory. And we see that happen in Scripture. But he himself is untouched by sin. And we see that truth in the life of Christ as well. And in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26, it says there, speaking of Jesus, it says, For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. That's Jesus. Look at what it says. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Jesus himself was not tainted by sin. And you remember the account, don't you, of his temptation. If you read Matthew chapter 4 or Luke chapter 4, Jesus, remember, was led by the Holy Spirit into the, into the wilderness to face some of Satan's temptations. And remember, Jesus had fasted for 40 days and nights, and he was hungry. And it was at that time that Satan comes to him and tempts him. In fact, you could say it this way, Satan tested him. And Satan wanted Jesus to fail the test. He wanted him to give in to the temptation by sinning, but you know what happened, right? You know the story. Satan tempted Jesus. He appealed to the desires of his flesh. He appealed to the pride of life. He appealed to the desires of his eyes, but Jesus passed the test with flying colors. Jesus was never going to fail that test. Jesus never sinned. He didn't sin. He couldn't sin. In fact, we believe in what we would say the, the impeccability of Christ. You may not have heard of that. But the impeccability of Christ simply means that Jesus was not able to sin. He is the God-man, and God can't sin. And we just learned that in James 1 verse 13. He cannot, God cannot be tempted with evil. So it follows that Christ, who is the God-man, was unable to to sin. And even though he couldn't sin, the tests or the temptations that Jesus felt were still very real and very genuine. In fact, Jesus experienced the full force of them. And so his temptation was in that sense more real to Jesus than it was even to us, if you think about it, because Jesus felt the full weight of them without ever yielding to them or without ever giving in to them. In fact, if you compare the temptation of Jesus with the temptation of Adam, think about that. Adam was in the Garden of Eden. He was in this perfect place, and yet Adam gave in to temptation. Jesus was hungry, as I said. He was in a hot, dry wilderness, and yet he didn't give in to the temptation. You look at Adam, he was, living in, he, was, he was living in a perfect world at the very beginning, and yet he gave in to temptation. Jesus was living in a fallen world, but he didn't give in. Adam failed his first test. <laughs> Jesus never failed. And Adam's sin sent the whole human race into slavery to sin. And we know that Jesus' success over temptation and over Satan proved that he was the Messiah and that he had come to rescue sinners and was able to do that. No comparison between Jesus and Adam. <laughs> and then there's that wonderful verse in Hebrews 4, verse 15, that I'm sure you're familiar with. 
which says, We do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who, is, who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands what it's like to go through temptation. Yet he was not tempted to sin. He never sinned because he was God in human flesh. And back in James here, if you look at the end of verse 13, it says that God does not tempt anyone to sin. And you might even be thinking about that, and maybe you've been curious about this. I was thinking about it during the week and chatting to it with, um, with Benji and James and Gary. What about the Lord's Prayer? Have you ever thought about that? You know in the Lord's Prayer where it says, Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then it says this, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, some people read that phrase, and lead us not into temptation, and presume that somehow if we don't pray that prayer, then the opposite might occur, and that is that God will lead us into temptation, which would lead us to sin. And if that's what it meant, then obviously it would be in violation of what we've been looking at here in James chapter 1. When we pray this prayer, lead us not into temptation, I think what it means is that we are, we are asking God to protect us from the trials and the tests of life that we are prone to fail because of our immaturity. And we're asking Him to help us in those situations, help us to pass the test, as it were, to endure. And so the prayer, lead us not into temptation, is asking God to providentially protect us from those things that put too much pressure, if you want to say it that way, on our weak spots, because we're prone to give in to them. We certainly know that God does not cause us to sin. And there's another helpful verse that I think you want to keep in mind as we think about this whole area of temptation. And James read it to us this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's the verse 13 in that chapter. Uh, let me read that one to you again as well, because this, this verse is, is so helpful in so many ways. It says, no temptation, and there's that word again, it's the same word. You could translate it temptation or you could translate it trial or test. So you could say, no temptation trial or no test has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted or he will not let you be tested beyond your ability. But with the temptation or with the trial, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I mean, that's a great verse. It's a verse of hope. It reminds us that God is faithful. It reminds us that God is good. And you're not going to face a trial in your life that hasn't already been experienced by thousands of other Christians before you. There are no unique trials that are unique just to you. Christians have felt the same thing before. And God's not going to put you in the deep end of a trial and leave you there with no hope or no way to endure. It says in that verse that he's going to provide a way of escape. Not necessarily to escape from the trial so that you get out of it, but an escape that is going to help you to cope with the trial and even to endure it. That's the promise that God gives to his children. That in the midst of trials, he's not going to put us in something that we can't handle. And he's going to give us the strength and the ability to cope with it. That's an encouraging verse for us. So as we look at the nature of trials here and temptation, we see that the, the source of a temptation that ends in sin is certainly not God. But then we see in verse 14, because we want to ask the question, well, who is it? Who do we blame in a sense? And the answer is right there in verse 14. That is that we need to blame each individual person who commits the sin. Look at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. 
here we found the culprit. Each individual person who gives in to the temptation and sins is guilty of his own sin. You can't blame God. You can't blame Adam. You can't blame your spouse. You can't blame Satan. You can't blame a demon. You can't blame any other person. You can't blame your circumstances. You can't blame your social conditioning. You can't blame your family upbringing. You can't blame your health issues. You can't blame the government. You can't blame anyone. You can't blame anything else. If you have been tempted, and if you have failed the test and have sinned, there is only one person that you can blame. You. It is you. You and you alone. The blame falls fully on your shoulders. You are the guilty culprit. And notice that your sin does not originate outside of you. It originates in you, in your heart. It begins with your own desires. In fact, if you've got an NIV Bible, the NIV adds the word evil into this verse, which makes verse 14 say, by his own evil evil desire. And that in the context is okay to say that because that's what it means. You see, there is this, you could call it a, a principle of evil or a principle of sin that resides deep within our hearts. And it creates all kinds of problems for us. We have, you could say, an internal problem. There is this reality of indwelling sin that impacts the heart of every man and woman on this planet. And you might say to me, hey, Phil, help me understand a little bit about this heart issue that I have. And I want to do that. I want to give you maybe a big picture summary of why we have this situation in our heart. This is a little bit of what we might say the doctrine of sin. I think this is one of the most underrated doctrines in the church. Remember, Adam and Eve were created in the garden. We know that. They were created in God's image. And at that moment, God's image in them, when they were first created, was as perfect as it could humanly be. And I've already reminded us today that Adam sinned in the garden. And as a result of his sin, his guilt and his sin has been imputed, which means it has been passed on to every generation after him all the way down to us. It includes every single one of us. You can read about that in Romans chapter 5. And at that time, in the Garden of Eden, we call it the fall of man, in Genesis chapter 3, the image of God in man, in humanity, was distorted by sin. And every person since that time has inherited a sin nature from Adam that is present within us, and it was there from the day we were born. In fact, if you read Ephesians chapter 2, it tells us that we were born dead in our sins, dead in sins. That means that we were spiritually dead. That means that sin has affected every part of us, our mind, our will, our emotions, and therefore, Ephesians 2 goes on to say that we were, by nature, children of wrath. We were sinful children, you could say. In fact, if you read um, Psalm 51, David would say that his sin nature, and probably our sin nature in, in that sense, was imputed to him at conception in his mother's womb. And so as a result, our heart, our mind, our will, our emotions are corrupted by the sinful nature. And so when we were born, we were not born good, we were not born innocent, we were not born neutral, we are born sinners with a sin nature. And as cute as you think your children are, or as cute as you think your grandchildren are, and they are on the outside... But on the inside, their heart is corrupted by sin. They have a sinful nature. And they sin because 
they are sinners at heart. It's their nature. And as I said, one of the major problems, I think, in, <clears throat> in many churches today is that Christians don't understand the seriousness and the significance and even the spread of sin in their lives. We are sinners made in the image of God. That image has been distorted. It's not perfect yet, and it won't be perfect again until we get to glory. We have been imputed with Adam's sinful nature, and the consequences of that nature resides in us, in our hearts, where our desires and our passions are ignited, and the place where our decisions and choices are made. And so the fall of man in the Garden of Eden created havoc in the heart of man and in our world in general. We now have these desires and thoughts and intentions and lusts that are contrary to the perfect will of God and His original design. Remember Paul, he battled with this. He faced this dilemma in his own heart. You read Romans chapter 7. The things that he wanted to do, he didn't do. The things that he hated, he ended up doing. He understood the battle that was raging in his heart. He was battling with this law of sin or this principle of sin in his heart. And even though we might be saved, even though we might be a believer in Jesus Christ, even though we might be a Christian, we still struggle with heart issues, with that indwelling sin, because there is a war that is still going on inside of us. And that's why we see today all kinds of sinful thinking and all kinds of sinful desires, and these thoughts even happen in the minds of Christians. It's the very reason why a Christian might struggle with sinful lust for the opposite sex. It's the very reason why a Christian might struggle with same-sex attraction. It's the very reason why a Christian might desire even to adopt a new gender. It's the very reason why a Christian might desire fame and fortune, or the reason why a Christian battles with pride or any other sinful impulse that you can think of. All of these corrupt, sinful desires are found in the recesses of our heart and mind, and they are as a result of the fall and the distorted image that we still have. We all have a major heart problem. Inside of our heart are all of these sinful tendencies and desires that are sitting there, and it's kind of like they are lying there dormant, waiting for temptation to come in order for them to conceive. In fact, let me say it this way. Listen to this. You have inside your heart the potential to commit every possible sin that there is to commit. If you were placed in the right environment at the right time, and then you might commit one of those sins. I mean, if you struggle with that concept, I would encourage you to think deeply about the doctrine of sin. I like to use this illustration or example. Think about a, a large oak tree. It produces something like 10,000 acorns every year. And all of those acorns have a seed inside of it with the potential to become a new oak tree. But most of them don't become trees at all. That seed inside the acorn needs the right circumstances and it needs the right environment to grow into a new tree. Well, likewise, in our heart, we have all the potential seeds of sin but they are not going to all germinate and become sins. But some of them will when you give in to temptation. Now, each one of us has, a, has different challenges. Your temptations and your struggles with sin will be different to mine and vice versa. But the Bible teaches us that our hearts, even if we are saved, are still subject to these sinful tendencies. Remember Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
I mean, that's a consequence of the fall. Jesus spoke of the evil nature of our heart in Matthew 15, verses 18 and 19. You'll see it in a minute. Jesus says this, But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, and you could list every other sin that you can think of. That applies to Christians as well as unbelievers. Now, don't get me wrong. As Christians, we don't want to wallow in our sin. We don't want sin to be the overwhelming emphasis of our life. But we need to have a healthy understanding of its ongoing effects in our life. Because we are not primarily sinners who are saved. We are saints who sometimes sin. That should be the emphasis of our life. Now I realize that as believers in Christ, the power of sin in our lives has been broken. We are no longer slaves to sin. We are set free from the power of sin because of what Christ has done for us. However, before salvation, before we became Christians, we were in a terrible position. The Bible says that an unbeliever is a slave to sin because their nature is sinful. That's what even Ephesians 2 told us. And at that time, when you're an unbeliever, We had the freedom or we had the free will to operate within that nature. But because our nature was sinful, we had no ability or desire actually to obey God. When we were unsaved because of our sinful nature, we were free only to sin. Unbelievers are not forced to sin. They're not coerced to sin. They do it naturally. They want to do it. Just as a rabbit would happily eat a carrot or lettuce because that's its nature, or a tiger will happily eat meat, or a pig will happily hollow in mud because that's its nature, so too a sinner's nature leads him to happily and willingly sin. He doesn't want to please God. In fact, he can't please God. He can't obey God according to Romans 8 verses 7 and 8. So as we think of James 1, verse 14 here, it says, Each one is tempted and sins by his own evil desire. God does not coerce or force man to sin. He never has and he never will. We do it freely. As unbelievers, that's all we can do, but even as believers, We will freely sin. And man sins because his nature is sinful. And therefore, as a result of that, he is fully culpable and accountable for his sin. And so you can never blame God at all for any of your sin. As I said before, as Christians, the power of sin is broken. The penalty of sin has already been taken care of when Christ died on the cross for us. But the ongoing presence of sin is still there. It hovers within us. There is this indwelling sin that still affects us. And remember, James, as he writes this letter, he's writing to Christians as Christian friends. And it seems like some of them have already been sinning. That's why he's writing this thing. And so he's making it blatantly clear that there is something inside each one of them that is causing the sin. It's a sinful desire in their heart. That is the the source of temptation. It's not God, but it's our own heart. And I want to quickly just move on to verse 15 and talk about like the sequence of temptation just to see, help you see how this thing unfolds. In fact, it's verses 14 and 15. It says there that each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so James gives us the sequence here that takes place when, when temptation to sin occurs. As I've just explained to you, it begins in the heart. 
because we know our hearts are far from pure. They're still full of all kinds of potential sins. They have, we have these desires and passions and inclinations that lead us to sin. That principle of sin is still within us. But those sins, as I said before, they kind of sit dormant, if you want to say it that way. But they are ready to ignite if they are exposed to certain circumstances. If something grabs our attention, it can easily lead to a sinful temptation. And so James uses here in verse 14 the hunting and fishing terminology to describe the sequence of temptation. He says each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed. That word lured was often used to describe an animal trap. If you can think of like a rat trap or a possum trap that was baited with food on the inside to lure the animal into the trap. That's the, the picture that James is using here. And the second word, the word enticed, he, he took that from fishing terminology when the fisherman put the bait on the hook to try and catch the unsuspecting fish. I mean, you understand, right, that all fishermen are really deceivers. That's what they are. That's a terrible occupation. You really don't want to be known as a deceiver, do you? But uh, that's what they really are doing, right? They put that lure on out into the water, or they put the bait into the water, and that poor fish, he's just swimming around, minding his own business, and then all of a sudden, it's distracted by something that looks attractive, and it pounces, and it snatches the bait, and it has no idea that that bait is going to be the last feed it has before death takes its life. That's how temptation and sin works. It's crouching at the door. It's waiting for an opportunity to pounce when the time is right and when the environment is conducive for the attack. And so temptations can happen anywhere and everywhere. It could, could be any time. It could be as you're driving down the road and you're looking up at a billboard or as you're watching a scene in a movie or if you're looking at a new car that you like, drive down the, the road. Or maybe you see a wad of cash lying on the footpath. Or maybe if you're going to a busy beach. These are all places where temptations can take place. Maybe you're reading a social media post. All of these things can hook us in. All of those things may in and of themselves be okay, but when the lure is cast, when the bait is set, it's so easy for sin to be conceived. And as I said before, we all have different triggers, you could say, in our lives that kickstart sin in our heart. Something that sets me off might not set you off, but and the other way around as well. And so temptation begins when each one is lured and enticed by his own evil desire. And then James just moves to another metaphor. He goes from the hunting and fishing one to a biological metaphor, the birthing of a child, he talks about in verse 15. And so the sequence of temptation continues. That evil desire is likened to a mother who conceives, and a pregnancy begins, and a baby is on its way. And that baby has a name from the moment of conception, that baby is called sin. And it's the ugliest baby you will ever see. It starts growing at a rapid rate of knots, and if it is ignored, nothing is going to stop that baby from getting bigger and bigger until the day it is birthed, and then it will continue to grow. And practically speaking, from that moment of conception in the heart of that person, that was when the sin began. From the moment that sinful desire was set in motion or triggered or conceived in the heart of man, we have for ourselves right at that point a sinning Christian. It begins in the heart. And if that sin is left unchecked, untouched, and unconfessed, it will continue to grow and there will only be one outcome, according to James, and that is death. Death. If sin is left to run its course without any intervention from God or from man, the final result is death. Sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's why sin is so devastating. That's why sin is such an enemy, because its natural outcome is death. We normally think of birth giving life, but this is giving death. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. And the Bible talks of three kinds of death that occur for an unbeliever. There's spiritual death, which is the separation of the soul from God. There's physical death that we know, the separation of the body and soul. And there is eternal death, which is the separation of the body and the soul from God forever in the lake of fire. 
And if an unbeliever follows this process of temptation, the sequence, if he remains in his sin, he will go all the way to his death, his eternal death, and he won't be able to blame God for it. You can't blame God for any of your sins. And by the way, just quickly, when James is speaking about death in this verse, he's not saying that a sinning Christian will face eternal death. He's not saying that if you're a Christian and you don't deal with your sin, you're going to lose your salvation because we know that's impossible. When you look at Scripture, you look at multiple passages in Scripture that teach us that you can't lose your salvation. There's, there's no evidence that a Christian can lose their salvation. That's not what James is saying here. A Christian does not experience spiritual death. A Christian does not experience eternal death. The only death that we will face as a Christian is physical death. In fact, there are examples even in the Bible where Christians lost their lives because they weren't confessing their sin. You read, the, read about the church in Corinth, right? In 1 Corinthians 11, there were people who were messing around with communion, and as a result of it, they lost, they lost their lives. That is why Paul says, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. And that's a warning for us if we are Christians, that we need to fight these temptations, fight these conceptions, fight these sinful births. We're not to entertain sin. We're not to, we've got to stop that sequence, as it were. And maybe even as we finish up now, just as we think about this, if you're, if you're struggling with temptation in your life, if you keep slipping into sin, you keep falling into sin, you keep failing the test, I want to say to you that there is hope for you to be able to overcome that. You can run to Jesus Christ. You can run to the cross. We've sung about it this morning. Romans 13 verse 14 says that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. If we turn our eyes upon Christ, as we've talked about this morning, that is what we need to do. Look to Christ. Jesus even says, if you're weary, if you're battling in life, if you're struggling in life, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. There is hope for the struggling Christian. 1 John 1 verse 9 is speaking to Christians. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive you your sin. You know what? The gospel is not only powerful to save you, the gospel is powerful to sanctify you, to change your heart, to help you overcome those sinful temptations. Galatians 5 verses 16 and 17 says, But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. So think about these wonderful truths. James 4 verse 7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. All of these things are, are truths and principles that we need to embrace to help us overcome temptation. We need to learn those principles and apply them to the area of our lives that we most need them. We need to identify our struggles and our temptations and we need to address those areas with biblical truth so that we can overcome them, so that we can pass the test. Remember when Jesus was tempted, he came straight back to the devil with the word of God, with, with references from the book of Deuteronomy. That's what we need to be able to do. Let the word of God richly dwell in us and use it to, to help us to overcome our challenges and our temptations. And if you need help doing that, we'd love to help you. I know James sitting up here would love to help you if you want to talk to him even after the service today about anything, he'd talk with you and pray with you. If you need help with that, come and see us. I mean, I've burned the clock this morning, I know, but there's a lot more I want to say. I'll bring it up next week as well. But just be thinking about these issues and what Scripture says to us about temptation. We all struggle with it, but God is gracious and He's given us hope and He's given us the resources to be able to deal with these things. We don't have to be languishing in failure after failure after failure because God's given us the resources and the strength to be able to overcome these things. We you bow your head with me as we pray? Father, this is, a, I think, a relevant and a, a practical passage which 
applies to all of us, Lord. It's, we're thankful that the Word of God is living, it's true, it's accurate, it's, it's your Word, it's the, the Word of the living God. And so I pray that you would help us to understand these truths, Lord, help us to understand the impact of sin in our own hearts and our own lives, but Lord, help us to understand what Christ has done for us, that He has paid the price and the penalty for our sin, and He has even given us the resources through his word through his presence, through the spirit of God living in us to, to be able to live lives that please you and lives that are holy and righteous. And so, Lord, we, we understand there's a battle going on, but we can win the battle. Help us to do that, we pray. Help us to overcome the flesh. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to be righteous, to be holy, to be the kind of Christians that you want us to be. Lord, as we go from here today, give us a good day, a good day of fellowship, a good day of interaction with others. As we go into the working week and the study week, the holiday week, whatever's coming up this week, Lord, I pray that you'd give us great opportunities to serve you and to serve others, to demonstrate our love for you and our love for one another in, in multiple different ways. And so, Lord, help us to do that. Thank you for this service. Thank you for the privilege of being able to meet together. Thank you for fellowship. Thank you for the church, Lord. Thank you for your kindness and your love and your grace to each one of us. We just want to bring you the glory in everything that we've, we do and all that we've done this morning, Lord. We want you to be praised and you to be glorified. Lord, bless this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen.